Welcome to RGBA, Colorful Tech News and Reviews. This is episode 56. My name is Alexandre Vallier-Lagasse, and I'm joined by my co-host, Tadir Minar. All right, starting up with the follow-up this week, um, the guys behind the juice board, the electric skateboard I reviewed a couple episodes ago, uh, they basically successfully completed their Kickstarter, and how many? they got like so many orders. Uh, I think they crossed even the $200,000 uh, threshold. Let me see exactly the amount. It's $257,000. Um, Indigo doesn't give you like a straight-up number for the number of people who backed it, but you could basically like add all the the little uh, uh, rewards to see exactly how many. But basically, it's 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 a lot of boards. So they completed that uh, kicks, uh, that Indiegogo campaign, and now they already posted a new update saying that uh, as things are with those um, Kickstarters and Indiegogo campaign, they introduce a delay of three weeks. Uh, the reason being that they uh, basically made some major changes to the board, and uh, not to the look, not to the specs but more to the power of the board um, if you remember uh, during my review what i had is the dual board which was the dual motor so two of the wheels the two from the back had a uh, motors and they are now announcing that the single version has the exact same power as the dual which i had as a pre-production unit and the new dual has 30 percent more performance so this is in uh, the torque but uh, directly it's not that it's going to go further 30 percent, but it's just that you're going to reach your maximum speed 30 uh, percent faster uh, so they, what they did is they showed you like uh, on a little video uh, on a straight uh, road the pre-production board versus the final version board and the two guys look to be about the same weight and they just go go on it and you can see that that 30 percent really makes a difference i think it's the uh, same personal, guy it's two guys. It's uh, Edward and Matty, the oh. two co-founders. Okay, because oh. there's another video showing me it's the same guy on the on the same on different boards, but like uh, the screen is cut in the middle. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. oh, the same guy. Oh, well, yeah. Anyways, uh, so yeah, basically that's uh, that's the good news for that. Um, also, they changed a bit the controller. Um, the uh, they made like a, a rubberized uh, coating instead of being a regular shiny plastic, so that fits better in your hand. It's less, it's it's more grippier. And one problem I had with my remote was that the second time I put it on, I basically broke the uh, lanyard. So they made that wider, bigger, and adjustable, kind of like your your Apple TV remote or your Nintendo Wii uh, remote. Basically, the lanyard is very large, and there's a little piece in the middle that you can adjust. So that's it. And uh, to uh, excuse themselves, if you wish, uh, for that two, three weeks delay, uh, they're including for all backers a second fast charger. That's a $50 value. Basically, when you bought the board, you had one uh, $50 value charger uh, that could charge the board in an hour or less. And now you have a second one for free because they just want you to be happy, basically. So all in all, uh, this is pretty nice stuff for, from Juiced. Uh, I spoke with Edward yesterday, and I'm hoping to get my hands on the final uh, production unit uh, very soon, as soon as they can get a couple more uh, shipped to their uh, their company in Alberta, because uh, right now they are still only have a couple of boards, and they need to keep them for, for videos, for testing and stuff. So as soon as the, let's say, the major order comes from the, the manufacturer, uh, they should be able to send me one for fi my final review. So that's it for Juiced. Moving on to the news. Uh, a couple weeks ago also, could also be follow-up, but now it's just, I think it's an ever, a never-ending story <laughs> of uh, Qualcomm versus Apple. Uh, there was a problem a couple uh, months ago, I would say, where Qualcomm was fighting against Apple. Qua uh, Qua Apple helped the FCC in some investigation. Qualcomm was pissed, so they, they didn't want to to pay whatever money they owned Apple. Apple started to sue them, so I don't know where it's at, but basically now Qualcomm is going one step further and tries to block the imports of certain iPhone and iPads. So I don't know if you remember uh, the iPhone 7 had 
two providers for the uh, cellular chip. There was Qualcomm and the other one, I don't remember exactly. Wasn't it Samsung? But I'm not sure. No, I think it was either Intel or somebody else for the um, LTE chip. So basically, they would try to block anything that has uh, a Qualcomm chip, I guess, in there. So yeah, this is the kind of uh, saga that's going to last a couple of months, if not years. So we'll see where that goes. But that's not going to be pretty. Motherboard uh, released a little story this week about uh, security researchers that do not report bugs to Apple. So if you do not know, basically, there are security researchers who are actually trying to find uh, weaknesses and backdoors into apps, services, uh, even components of an operating system just to really like make sure it's secure. And the incentive they have to do that is that when they report a bug to Google, Facebook, Apple, whatever, there are usually bounties. So the more the more important the bug is, the more dangerous this backdoor or this thing could be used for a hack is, the more money they get. But the thing is that for iOS, those bugs are so important for the jailbreak community, for the... Um, uh, forensics companies that basically the incentives from Apple to report the bugs are way lower than what they can get from other, let's say in air quotes, uh, sources that are legit. Or third parties. <laughs> yeah, third parties. Let's call them third parties. Yeah. So that security researchers basically do not know, well, the one that they interviewed do not know anyone from their, uh, their, their, their gangs or from their. their their, their colleagues that ever reported to Apple bugs because the money they can make from third parties is so much bigger. So that's a major problem for Apple. Uh, we all know that jailbreaks is all fun and, and amusing up until that there's one site you visit or one SMS you receive and then your your iPhone is is owned or your iPhone is bricked. So that that's why they should really increase those amounts, uh, especially that they have so many devices on the market that it's not only a major target, it's also one that many, many people try to uh, get access to uh, using uh, those those bugs. So they really should increase the, the amount of money they give. Yeah, there's an example here. You can get 1.5 million from Zerodium or you can get uh, 200K from Apple for the same bug same zero day exploit the decision is not hard to make when you get the one to five <laughs> yeah. one to six uh, times the the amount okay so our favorite corner in this summer well every summer the rumors corner uh all the rumors are talking about the iphone obviously and i, I don't know if you read it but john gruber posted a nice like speculation on price I, I yeah, I've know. seen the, the tweet. I've seen the tweet and I've seen that they're just going to probably delay the inductive charger for later this year. Kind of like what they did with the portrait mode. Yeah. Uh, but that's all I read. Right. And do, I don't know if you remember back in when the watch was announced and he had a nice article saying that, there, I don't know if he had an article, but he was on record saying that the edition would be like um, uh, $1,500, I think. Yeah, I remember, remember that. And everybody said, hey, you're crazy, you're crazy, what are you talking about? Well, you did it again now for the new iPhone. So basically, he his scenario, he has two scenarios. One of his scenario is an iPhone 7 at $100 less, an iPhone 7S at the same price as the iPhone right now. So like the normal iPhone price, if you want, normal new iPhone price. And then an iPhone 8 or D deluxe i think he calls it in the other girl or iphone pro or however you want to call it for um 1200 dollars or maybe 1500 dollars yeah that is uh, very expensive but not that expensive considering another news just a quick parenthesis here um red cameras makers of amazing 4k and 8k cameras announce a holographic display technology on a new uh, cell phone for this year so, which will be $1,500. So, <laughs> this will be a cheap iPhone compared to this red iPhone, <laughs> a red phone. And also, he talks about one thing that I didn't think about, the supply constraints for these OLED panels. Um, what happens if, the, not what happens, but 
if the iPhone, the new iPhone doesn't sell, like, I think it's 50 million in the first quarter or something like that, it's going to be considered like a failure. But what happens if they can't deliver 50 million iPhone 8 or iPhone Deluxe because of supply constraints? So the way you do it is you just put the price higher so less people are going to buy it, kind of, sort of. And then people are going to fall back to the 7S, which is still going to be a great phone, but at the normal iPhone price. Yeah, I don't know if it's a good idea to restrain the offer like that. Um, I'm thinking that it's been like, what, three years, if not four, that there were rumors uh, from the supply chain that the next iPhone would be OLED. So I'm guessing that in 2018, Apple probably managed to get the quality they want, even uh, with the, the DCI-P3 color gamut uh, technology that they included this in this year's phone. So I'm really hoping that like they got it right and they're able to get whatever amount of screens they need. I don't think that Apple would risk it. Like say that the next iPhone has an OLED screen and basically at the later at the last minute said, Oh, you know what? We could only make 50, 15 millions. So whoever wants one, you'll have to go on eBay and pay 4,000 bucks to get one. You know, I'm pretty sure they won't, that's not going to happen. So if they do release an OLED display, then it will be, uh, there will be enough of those. Uh, what we still don't know now, because all those rumors usually come from the supply chain uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, will all three iPhones, like the iPhone 7S, 7S Plus, and the magical iPhone Pro, whatever, um, will they all have OLED display, or is it only the base, the, the most expensive one? Um, I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking that this uh, <laughs> this more expensive phone really needs something flashy, different to make it worth the upgrade in terms of price. Um, and I think OLED could be that. Then again, maybe they got sorted it out and they can really put it in all three phones. Uh, we'll see. I don't think but, it uh, would come in all three phones. I think they'd have to go LCD with the, the old, well, not the old, the 7S. Yeah, that would be safer. Uh, unless they, like Apple is usually doing that. They have two or three suppliers for components. Um, it was useful for the watch, for example, because the Taptic engine was made by a Japanese company and a Chinese company, and those from the Chinese companies were not as good quality, so they were breaking in the first couple of weeks. So they just basically turned around to the Japanese company and said, here, it's a pile of money. Take your like two assembly lines and make them eight and make them run 24-7 and start today and to just like get enough components to fix all the Apple Watches. So they probably have... LG from as in terms of display provider, probably Samsung and maybe a third party one, maybe like um, um, what's it called? Sharp, Sharp Displays or somebody else. So maybe all those providers together, they are able to provide enough quality and enough units that they will fulfill the demand. But yeah, we'll have to see. Um, another thing Minji Kuo is saying is that they're going to start at 64 gig. The minimum that makes sense <laughs> yeah i really hope it's true i'd be surprised though they took so much time to get to 32 would they really yeah. make the jump already to 64 but that'd be good just for the quality of the pictures that we're taking now they're so big compared to what we used to yeah especially if they have new cameras maybe they go 16 megapixel maybe they do 4K with 60 frames per second. If that's oh, yeah, the case, you, then... You were talking about videos. Uh, videos of your kids take up so much space and you can't practically yeah. take any. Yeah, the weird thing is I tried to either 1080p 60 frames per second. And for some reason on my Apple TV with Infuse, uh, it just doesn't work. Like it's one frame per three seconds. So that, that's like very awful. But 4K 30 frames per second works fine. Um, but that's probably because it's... Uh, the new codex, since I'm on a, the iOS 11 beta, so it's the HEVC and HEIF, HIF and HIFC. <laughs> yeah, don't even try. <laughs> yeah, hey, let's call it HEVC. So yeah, basically that I had problems with that. So, but like the, the file size are like getting the gigs like so rapidly, and you if you start to film a couple of minutes, you easily get into the four, five, six, seven gigs, and just think about somebody who does video a lot uh, for whatever reason that 64 gigs can be filled in just like half an hour or less and if you get 4k because right now you have 4k 30 frames per second that's the highest quality you can go 
if you want to go higher in terms of frame rate, you need to go down to 1080p. But what if the new iPhone has 4K 60 frames per second? Then that's double the file size right there. So you'll get like, what, like uh, maybe two gigs per minute or something. So you'll be able to film a couple of minutes and then your phone will be filled. So that, yeah, 64 gigs is kind of like a, a, a minimum at this point. Yeah, because right now they say that it's 170 megs for 4 gig, for 4K, for a minute of 4K, sorry. 170 megs yeah. for 4K? Yeah. Only? Yeah. I thought it was more than that. That's what it says right here on the okay. in the camera settings. Okay. Yeah, but also yeah, it's true. But also if you get those new phones with iOS 11 and you have HEVC, then possibly that this number will stay the same but you will be able to gain 60 frames per second because of the compression that's much better. So there could be like a gain to be the, uh, having here. Uh, or if you go back to 1080p, 30 frames per second, then you can cut in half the space it takes. So that would help, but still, 64 gigs in 2018 is like, I would say, a minimum. Um, I wouldn't buy less. I wouldn't even ask my girlfriend to buy less. Uh, the only thing I need is more iCloud storage, so that's good. It's coming with the family plan, so I'll be able to share my big terabyte with my family and stop having them bug me because they cannot do their backup from iCloud to iCloud. So. Yeah, I'm interested to try that too. Yeah, as soon as it's released, uh, I'll get all our devices updated and jump on the family plan. That will be much easier. I I don't know if you can do just the family plan for the iCloud storage and not do family plan for App Store and all that, but we'll see how it works. Yeah, I hope it's for everything. It will be much simpler to understand and also to explain in the documents. Right. So what do you think about the inductive charging? Don't care for it. No? No. So for you, having like your, your phone on a mat or your phone plugged in a lightning cable is the same? I, I always have, I have docks everywhere, so it's, I don't know. If yeah. it's easier, it's almost, it's nicer in a dock and it's not more, it's more convenient because you see the phone up, right? You don't have to like, I don't know, take it off of the dock, take it off of the pad, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, or, or pick it up, yeah. yeah. You just leave it there. I just leave it there at work all day. And yeah, that's I, it. If the connector was not lightning, if it was something like a USB A, which had like a right side and a wrong side, I could see the gain of a inductive charging mat. But now that we have lightning, it's so easy to just plug it. I I, I plug my lightning headphones every night uh, without looking. Uh, basically, I just follow the home button and then click. If almost every time I get it the first try, so it's not like if lightning was a hard connector to use. So inductive charging could be nice but then again the only really only place i could use it would be like on a desk like at home or at work but then again it's a small mat it's not like if the whole desk surface was uh, inductive uh, ikea uh, started to offer i think i don't know if it's, if it's worldwide uh, or if it's just in the europe or in us but they offer like a options like you can get their desks and you can have like uh, inductive pad included in the desk so you can get like accessories and then you just install them but that's like a big black circle on the top of a white desk so it's it's not nice and it's physically like at a position where you cannot move it so if you change your desk setup you change your screen or you change whatever you decide to put your laptop on the left of your screen instead of behind your screen or to the right then you're screwed because that thing stays there so yeah it's 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 nice, but is it nicer than what we already have? I don't think so. Is it a must need feature? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, ducks for me are still the way to go. Uh, there are so many good ducks nowadays, so you don't need to to get something like that. I'd see it in a car. I don't know why. Like you just throw your phone in the cup holder, and the cup holder is like an inductive charging thing. Yeah, that that would be better. Uh, I have a magnet on my in one of my air vents, so that's why. I, that's and I have a a metal plate that I right, stick to right. the back of my you phone inside that. the case. Yeah, and uh, just that, that I just put like that. It's propped up perfectly fine for GPS navigation and for uh, small interaction interactions uh, for music or whatever. So, and I have like a uh, twelve volt uh, light lighter 
adapter to get my my power but if that little thing in the back could be it that would be even better so yeah i agree that the uh, cup holder or some kind of uh, air vent system uh, would be the best uh, just have to hide the wire then but yeah, uh, little yeah. cubby like the little storage areas there you can just throw your phone in and it would charge yeah that would be great yeah uh, it's th all three sizes sizes sides and the bottom would be all inductive and you just as long as your device touches one of these sides, you'd be good to go. Yeah, because Ryan Jones, the guy, that, the developer from um, Weatherline, he posted, um, he found, I don't know if he found or he, he made a um, 3D printed round disc that like fits in his cup holder of his, of his car to fit uh, an iPhone. as Like it converts to the cup holder as a, as a dock, basically. I can okay. dig it up and show you it's going to be easier because I know the explanation I just gave is horrible. <laughs> so look, I just shared a picture with you in Slack. Yeah. So, okay. It, okay. So it's basically just like a dog adapter, if you want, that fits. Yeah. In his cup. But, like, but it's not like inductive charging or anything. It's just a no, regular no. dog with a, with a lightning cable in there. No. And then okay. he has a Shapeways uh, link. If you happen to have a uh, the same model BMW is, as he has. Okay. Well, that's nice. And how much do they sell this little plastic part? $34. Canadian. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. I like these because you can always hit the 3D button and just turn around the, 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 the little shape and see exactly how it's made. Okay, I see it. Okay, pretty nice. Nicely done. So you put in your cable in there, it's just fixed there, and then the rest is just plastic that fits directly into the cup holder. That's nice. If the cup holder would be inductive charging, it'd be cool. That's why I was yeah. thinking about it. In the car, for the car. Yeah, for real, yeah. Um, Talking about cars, did you do you have activated the iOS 11 feature there of um, do not disturb while driving? Yeah, I'm thinking of disabling it, basically. <laughs> Okay. It gets on my nerve. Yeah, I already disabled it too. Especially uh, if you're a passenger in the car. Yeah, uh, that, that that's the worst thing because you don't it, it doesn't know if you're right, driving or not. So yeah, yeah. No, I, I, the idea is great. Like the blocking notifications, fine. Blocking text messages, fine. But like so often. I, I need to know just something, not that I need to take my phone and text while driving, but just glance at a message and just coordinate with my, my wife or something, or she, she might just send me a text saying, okay, don't forget this at the grocery or whatever. But then I get to the grocery, but since I didn't get any notifications, I just go in, go out, and then I when I got back to my car, take my phone out of my, my pocket to put it back on the dock and then realize that she asked me like 12 minutes ago, uh, to not forget something which I just forgot, so it's 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 yeah, it, it gets on my nerves basically. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I I forgot to try because I disabled it too fast. But I wanted to try in the train if it gets enabled in the train or in the metro. Uh, I would. Uh, you, you know what? I'm I'm thinking that it even gets activated when I'm driving my skateboard <laughs> because most of the times when I got I got to work in the morning, you sent me a slack or a text or whatever but i i'm i'm sure i did not feel my watch buzz during the, the the ride so i'm pretty sure that even while doing skateboard it basically guesses that i'm going too fast so i must be driving and gets into the do not disturb mode and then by the time i get to work like pass my key card and get in the office and everything uh when i look at my phone then i see all your your messages but i don't see the um, do not disturb mode so i'm i'm Almost sure that it also triggers when you're just riding a bicycle or a skateboard or roller skates or whatever. Okay, so we're gonna have to test this this week. It's yeah, homework. there's, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of rain going on until Tuesday, but after that, I think we should be okay. So, discussing the iPhone eight, um, there is also rumors that all three phones will have OLED display. Like we said, I don't believe that. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it has to be something very special for the big iPhone Pro and just like a magnesium shell or something like that, that wouldn't be enough. Like they need to keep a couple of features for that device. Um, but if you want to see exactly how this iPhone 
would look like. There's even like a video of a physical mock-up. So, you know, we, we've seen renders. We've seen renders of the iPhone 8, the vertical cameras and stuff. But now there's somebody who actually made one uh, using glass and metal, I guess. And you can see it on YouTube, like being handled in a very nicely done video. So the link's in the show notes if you haven't seen it. It's pretty nice. Um, then again, I'm surely not going to jump on this uh, just because of the cameras. Uh, I have my Moment case, my Moment lens, which is a wide, a wide lens, which I love. And changing phones would mean that there will be no uh, accessory for that for a while. Uh, just thinking that the iPhone 7S was released last September. We're now July and I just got my Moment case. So if they were to do the same thing with the next iPhone, you would still need to wait another year. So yeah, that wouldn't be good for me. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, the look is nice. Um, I really love the the way that the, the top part of the, the bezel looks. Like it's only uh, the lens is in the middle and on the sides you can have screens. So that's a very nice way to use to leverage all the space for the screen and for touch id well we can jump in that discussion but uh i, I don't think it's going to be removed like there's so many discussion this week about people saying that it's going to be removed replaced by a face recognition so, uh, thing and how do you handle just looking at the phone but not unlocking it or not approving some apple pay stuff for me uh Touch ID will stay uh, for just one simple basic reason. It's proven tech. And also it's the reason why Apple was able to get banks on board with Apple Pay is because of that little sensor. So if they remove it, then they need to quickly renegotiate contracts and prove to the banks that this face thing is as secured or better than the fingerprint. And just with general knowledge. Fingerprints are used for CSI's stuff, so crime scene investigation, because they're reliably unique. So people know that if you have some sensor that scans your fingerprint and it works, it's gonna be unique. But your face, this has already been done by Samsung and it's already been easily circumvented. So that sucks. Uh, Apple would need to like do so much work before releasing that that we probably would have heard some higher exec of bank x saying that oh we're so proud to be partnered with apple with the new face technology or whatever so that won't happen if the face technology is included it's going to be an add-on feature for some of the workflows but not replacing touch id for sure yeah me too i don't think they'd remove touch id yeah, at this point, it's, it's it's so proven, it's so nice that it's it has to stay. Like I understand the face thing and all that, but Touch ID is a lot more convenient. Especially, yeah. The best example is in the dark, or I I'm not sure how they do it. Yeah, and and also as Apple usually is, the first generation of something basically works. It works well, but it's not the best. It's not like perfect so if they were to release this face screening thing this year it would be nice it would probably work but i don't think it would be as fast as it could be um whereas if the second year they like they did with the touch id 2 that's really when this thing got like so fast that it's basically like frictionless you you don't need to hold your finger too long just by touching it it basically registers so i'm thinking that this same uh, frictionless use would only be available in the second generation of phase detection. So that's why I'm, I'm very doubtful that we're going to see this as a replacement for this here. Uh, probably just an extra feature, but yeah. Um, the guys on Connected had a very d good discussion about it this week. Uh, did you listen to it yet? Yeah, I did. But they go through like all stages of... Um of gr not of grief but they, they start five stages by, of grief yeah yeah or something like that they go th they don't like it but then they come they come to it and then they don't like it again it was funny yeah <laughs> but i just basically think that we're still gonna have the fingerprint sensor because it's easier more secure than the face thing the face thing is a bit too mission impossible i find <laughs> like i don't know <laughs> yeah. because we know mission impossible is so fake the face thing looks so fake to me yeah, it, there's so many ways. Like they're saying that it's gonna be like 3D mapping your face using uh, 
infrared light also when there's not enough light. So there's a bunch of sensors and camera types and stuff. It could work. Like all what they're saying makes sense. I don't doubt it, uh, but I don't think it's going to be a replacement. Um, yeah, I understand the five uh, steps uh, of grief from the guys at uh, Connected. Um, but seriously, for me, that thing will be just a li nice little gizmo. Maybe it's going to come to work with the new uh, lock screen notifications we don't like. Uh, having to swipe again to see your notifications from earlier today. Maybe just by seeing your face, you can see them all. M maybe it's going to use like emotions or face... Uh, facial expressions recognition so let's say you you can just like i don't know like uh, um, move your head left to right to say no or just top to bottom to say yes and it's gonna confirm your purchase or whatever that could all work but for me touch id is still the way to go and it's in the if it's in, if it's in the front and it's somewhere in the bottom just by looking at the the new siri icon it would make sense if it's not there and they couldn't put it there and it's behind the phone I've been using the Google Pixel for a couple of months now. It's it's pretty nice. It's it's very well placed and it's just a perfect depth. It it when I put my finger, it's always on it. It's always always reaching it like without any um, any problems. Uh, for example, that I have the LG G6 right now with me. Uh, it's not placed in the same way because the phone is uh, is longer and. Uh, a bit less wide, uh, so I, not, I do not always reach it properly. So in this case, it's not the best, but if they get the placement right, even if it's the back, for me, it's fine. I don't care. Yeah, the back, I think it's just a question of getting used to it, but it works It works pretty good. Yeah, yeah. If, if you get the ergonomics right, then you're, you're good to go. Moving on to Review Corner, um, I posted two reviews this week. Uh, one was the Ion Audio Max LP USB turntable, but actually I did review this in the in the podcast like a while back and I completely forgot about it. <laughs> it was in my pile of boxes and I just stumbled across it this weekend and said, yeah, I should probably post my review for that. So I did. Uh, basically, it's a USB pluggable turntable, so you can put vinyl records on it and listen through the um, embedded speakers, which are not too great, or plug in your headphones, which is much, much, much better. Uh, the sound quality is very good. Um, you can also plug it to your computer via USB cable that's provided, and it basically pops up as a external microphone. So you can use any recording software of your choice to record the audio. I use Audio iJack to, uh, to digitize a, the Hello Internet vinyl episodes that they released a couple of months back. Um, that's pretty nice. I could even like, I have two versions, one that's like pure recording and the other one where I remove the pops and clicks just to have a cleaner digital version. So both are available for you if you want to listen to, but I know you just want to, <laughs> to take that uh, turntable from me and just use it to have the whole experience. Yeah, I want the, <laughs> it's stupid. I have the vinyl as well, but I want to listen to my vinyl on the thing. I don't want, sure, I don't sure. want to listen to the, the file that you sent me. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. The experience is part of the fun. So, And the second product I reviewed was the Snap Power Guide Lights and USB Charger. So these are basically uh, electrical outlets uh, faceplates that you replace your existing faceplate with one of those. The first one, the Guide Light, is basically a LED, three LED lights that are um, casting light on the ground. So basically in the hallway, for example, you replace your outlets with this and whenever the uh, light level goes below a certain level, the LED opens up and it's a, it basically illuminates your hallway. So it's pretty useful as a nightlight, for example. Could be used also in bedrooms as a nightlight. And it's really is like you just remove the two screws or a single screw, depending on if you have a decor plate or the other one, which I don't remember the name, a duplex, I think. And you just screw that thing instead and it's basically done. You don't have any wiring to do. It basically has like two little uh, spring-loaded uh, contact points that basically go to touch the the screws where the plus and minus wires are hooked to your light switch or your um, or your uh, sorry your, your electrical outlet, and that's it. Like it, they just align perfectly, and that's fine. 
The USB charger one is cool. It's, it's the exact same thing as a guide light, but instead of having a light, it has a USB port. So it's a one amp USB port. So it replaces your iPhone charger, basically. Uh, you can also charge your iPad, but it's going to take twice as long as the regular charger. Uh, but it's like a, just a little, well, it's a large chin or forehead, depending if you install it to the top or to the bottom. Uh, there's only one port, so it's facing right. So in my case, I used it in my kitchen, on my kitchen counter. So I basically turned it upside down, so I have the port on top, so so it can be to the left, which is closer to where uh, our device are normally, our little corner where we have uh, high chairs for, for snacks and stuff. Like a bar, so, stool bar? Yeah, yeah, bar stool, yeah, kind of. So yeah, uh, very nice quality, v- uh, very great products. Uh, I've also backed in their campaign for uh, another version, which is basically a light switch version with a light, with the guide light, if you want. Uh, but they don't fit for some reason on my on my uh, light switches. So I have an open case with them trying to understand because the two prongs fit. They do hit the two screws. Uh, I'm wondering maybe if, if I have like a dead units. So I'll have to see. I, tr- uh, I backed them for three units. So I have three of those. None of them are working. So... There must be something wrong with something, so it's still under investigation. But the Snap Power guide lights and USB charger are fine. They work as intended. Uh, there's a bunch of pictures online. If you look at uh, my review on Ipsy Pixel, um, I gave them 82%. Uh, ease of installation, LED strength is perfect. Design is great. I would have preferred two amps for the USB port, and also two USB port would have been better. Uh, one on each side, for example, or two side by side on the same side. Because uh, it's very rare that you only have to plug one device. Uh, for example, on our kitchen counter, we usually have my wife's iPhone and my phone sometimes, or an iPad or whatever. So that would be the ideal, would be two ports, two amps each. Uh, but yeah, that's maybe asking too much for a small faceplate. Maybe there are limits to what they can do. Uh, that's why usually you have to replace the whole unit. So yeah, check them out. Uh, there'll be links in the show notes for that too. Do you have yours in the kitchen, you said, right? Yeah, the USB charger is in the kitchen, and the uh, guide light is in my hallway, uh, which is uh, the middle room uh, where we have uh, three bedrooms on the second floor. Perfect for if the kids want to go to the bathroom at night. Exactly, yeah. Or perfect for you if you want to go to the bathroom at night if you're scared of the dark. Yeah, I'm very scared of the dark, man. You don't have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it happens. It happens. It's okay. I know. I know. I know. (laughs) Yeah, it's for me. It's perfect placement. Uh, My son is getting older, which is my my youngest kid, so he doesn't need any nightlight anymore. So I don't need to install one in his room. But yeah, the hallway was just perfect, just so he doesn't trip on something in the way, like a Lego block or something. (laughs) Yeah, I remember my dad used to do a nightlight for me and my brother. It'd be the he'd leave the the light in the bathroom open and you'd like half close the door that was our night light yeah yeah that works too yeah th- this is a lot more clean yeah it's it's pretty nice uh, the quality is there uh, it's all certified things made by a Canadian company I think uh, so yeah it's pretty pretty nice go check it out so for the second review this week uh, well actually the third one uh, basically, I posted my TP-Link Deco M5 review. Um, this year, it really is the year of mesh networking. So there's Google, there's Linksys, and now TP-Link joined the club of offering uh, little hubs that are basically routers. And you can have between one, two, three, four, five, six, or depending on the company, uh, even like 50 of those if you need. Um, so yeah, it's a kit that you can buy from the, from Amazon and other vendors. It's either one or three in this case of the TP-Link and Deco M5. You are you have little pucks. They are basically uh, Wi-Fi routers and that basically communicates between each other and cover your, your, your house and Wi-Fi. So basically even their, their, their little uh, catchphrase is paint your home in Wi-Fi. Basically you have to place them in strategic uh, places and leverage the mesh networking capabilities to make sure that no matter where you are in your in your home in your home you can get the best wi-fi possible so i tested the three uh, unit version which is said to cover up to for 4500 square feet so it's quite it's quite large um, the design is very nice uh, i was skeptic at first because of the shape it's basically like a hockey puck 
kind of shape, a bit larger. Uh, but it's not like a tower because we've seen the most recent routers. They've all changed to the tower shape or multiple antennas. So if you want to keep your low profile, like the Linksys uh, uh, routers, but you basically have a flat unit, but have like six or eight antennas. And if you want to leverage the AC uh, technology from the Wi-Fi, you go like Apple did with the Airport Extreme and you get a tower thing. And there was also TP-Link that made some, D-Link or whatever. They all have this tower shape now. So when I've seen this, I said, hmm, the shape is nice looking, but I'm not sure it's going to be as powerful as the uh, Linksys VELOP system I tested a couple months ago, which is also tower shape. So each unit has a USB-C port, which is for the power and probably also diagnostic, I'm assuming. It, it also has two Ethernet jacks. Uh, these can, the first one, the first unit you plug in next to your router basically uses your one connection to paint your home in Wi-Fi. And for other units, well, there's a, something pretty nice that they made is instead of using the Wi-Fi as the back channel, so meaning communication going from your device back to the internet uh, over Wi-Fi, it can leverage the wired internet of your home. So if you have Ethernet jacks in your home here and there, if you install those little pucks near those Ethernet jacks, you can plug them in and leverage that to help with the communication. Basically make it faster for uploading and also response time. So as I said, you, first, you plug the first one uh, using the provided AC adapter and you plug your internet jack and then you just launch the app. And as it's the case with the Linksys and Google devices, basically it's using Bluetooth from your mobile phone. So you have to stand close to the, to the first puck to de detect it. And then it's gonna update its firmware because there's often uh, new uh, features. Uh, when I did mine, uh, one of the new features was the internet backhaul for function that I just mentioned. And then once it's updated, it's gonna activate your Wi-Fi, and then you can add more units. And for each of those, it's going to detect it, add it to the network, and then do a bunch of tests to make sure that the networking is up to speed. And then it's going to be done. So it's basically very easy, no technical knowledge needed. Uh, I would safely give this to my relative that is not very technical, te te tech savvy. Um, and yeah, so that, that was the installation process, very simple. The low profile helps uh, to have them around your house. They're not as, uh, I would say, as uh, eye-popping as a little tower. Uh, even though the Linksys Velop are pretty nice looking, they are still a big tower of plastic. This one could probably fit uh, on, uh, on your furniture and be more discreet. So that's very nice. And then we move to the performance. So as I usually do for my uh, little Wi-Fi testing, I basically leverage my NAS, which is super fast, which has gigabit internet and uh, four ports. So I can leverage, uh, I don't know how fast, maybe four to 500 megs per second as the top speed. And what I did is I, as I usually do, is I place myself in uh, five different places in my house. So there's my basement office, which is in diagonal to the machine room where I have my router. There's my basement living room, which is next to the machine room. And then there's the floor kitchen, main floor kitchen. Then there's the master's bedroom at the second floor and another bedroom at the opposite side of the house. So these four places really give me like a good example of how far the, the, the Wi-Fi can go and how fast it can go. So just to give you a quick example, uh, the fastest place in my house is basically the living room and be the basement which, for example, the Airport Extreme does 70 megabytes per second. So all these numbers will be in bytes. So it's the actual number of megs you can transfer. The VELOP does 48 and the TP-Link does 52. So not as fast as an Airport Extreme in a direct line of sight, but faster than the VELOP. So I was surprised with this first number. Then moving on to the office, the Airport Extreme does 50. And both uh, mesh network devices, the VELOP and the TP-Link, do 32 megs per second. So it's still very nice. Not as fast as the Airport Extreme though. And the main kitchen, the main floor kitchen, which is one level above and a little bit further away because the machine room is basically centered in the house. Uh, 
I have 15 megs per second for the airport extreme. So you see a big drop from 70 to 50 to 15 just by going one floor above. Uh, and then the, the, that's where the, the develop really shines. I get 28 megs per second and the TP-Link 15. Okay, so that was surprising, but not too much. Uh, I was expecting less performance from the TP-Link just by the shape of it. But then the fun stuff is when you go to the second floor. So for some reason, I don't know what magic they do, but uh, I'm getting 9 and 6 megs per second for the Airport Extreme. The Linksys Velop is a stable 18, but the TP-Link is 23 and 25. So you get almost like 50% faster from the second floor to the corner bedroom. So that's the f furthest point in my house away from the uh, router, uh, from the basement, of course. Uh, I placed the two... Uh, extra units, one in the kitchen and one in the master bedroom. So that's uh, pretty surprising. Uh, maybe the main floor kitchen could have been better. Maybe if I tried again a couple days later, maybe it would have optimized the network a bit more and maybe get closer to the 28 megs that the Lynx has filled up got, got. But yeah, after I plugged it in and I did like my usual three tests and get the average, uh, I got 15. So, But then again, 25 megs for the second floor is better than 15 for the first floor. I don't know if it's because I was leveraging maybe two of the units instead of one, depending on where you're, you stand. But yeah, it's uh, pretty surprising. I was very happy with the performance. Uh, I was not expecting that performance, seriously, because of the shape. But I was proven wrong, and the shape has basically no effect. Uh, they probably were able to place the antennas around the circumference of the circle. So that's pretty great. Uh, if you want to look for this, uh, there's often also rebates on it. Uh, at the time of writing my post, I think it's done now. Let me just double check to be sure I don't. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, there was a mass drop uh, group buy that was available for just uh, one ninety nine instead of two ninety nine. So it was a good rebate for the three unit K kit. So that's uh, that's because the, the Linksys Velop is rarely on on sale and it's very expensive. It's in the three to three fifty dollar range us uh, the tp link is close but it's often on sale so you might want to get this one it's cheaper and it's as good if not better i did not use the ethernet backhaul for my tests because uh, i did not do this it for develop and i wanted to really use the wi-fi mesh networking feature and not just a ethernet backhaul feature so just to make sure that the device I'm using really are leveraging the Wi-Fi part of the equation and not the uh, the wired internet. So in the end, I gave it 90%. Uh, great design, great coverage, great performance. It's still expensive. Um, and if you don't have any internet jack in proximity to the units, there's no dedicated uplink band. So for example, develop, you don't need per se uh, Ethernet jack because there's a dedicated band just for going back uplink to the internet. So that's how they, I don't know, circumvent the problem of network congestion on the single band is that they have another band just for going uplink. So that's a great idea. In this case, they are leveraging the Ethernet jack for that feature. So it's not bad. It's just a different way of seeing things. So if you have network Ethernet jack around your house, this TP-Link Deco M5 might be better for you because you can leverage that little Ethernet jack. So that's about it. So the conclusion of mesh networks, since you've tested them all now, is that they don't work, they don't have the as much high speed as like a dedicated router, but they cover a lot more area. Yeah. Yeah, basically, I always use the Airport Extreme because over the last couple of years, I've tried, I don't know how many watt routers, maybe like 15 to 20 routers. And the one that is the most stable in terms of speed has always been the Airport from Apple. The first, the, the flat ones, and now the tower one. And as you can see from these numbers, 70 megs per second is quite fast. So that's like over 500 megabits if you go it uh, the other way around. And that's on a same level. So if you have like a condo or an apartment, I would say you don't need any mesh networking because you don't, you cannot leverage that speed. 
uh, you'll get much better results from an Airport Extreme or the likes of a uh, Linksys uh, AC1900 or all the ACM3200 that you tested recently. So on a flat level, that's perfect. If you have multi-level, that's where really the mesh network shines. You can have units here and there, and you can cover a much bigger range. Uh, I, I would say the ideal scenario for those uh, mesh networking would be like a flat multi-generation house. So, you know, houses that are usually made uh, very long because you have maybe a main unit and then you have a bachelor or you have like a, a second set of rooms that are for your parents, for example, if you, if you want to live with your parents and take care of them, but still have their apartment and yours. Uh, so your house would not be high, so a single level, but like maybe 4,000, 5,000 feet, uh, so uh, square feet. So that would be like the ideal scenario because the deco really shines uh, in in very large areas and yeah. So yeah, this uh, being like the, is it the second one, third one? I don't remember, it's yeah. Third one, you did third develop one, yeah. and what's the other one? Uh, uh, no, I think it's the second one. I did develop and the TP-Link. There's still the Google Home, which I haven't tested yet. Uh, right now I'm playing with the, not Google Home, sorry, the Google Wi-Fi. Uh, so, and I think there's one from Netgear also, which I haven't tested. But looking at the specs, they're basically all the same. Uh, the only big spec difference is, like I said, the Velop has a uplink band that is dedicated. Uh, but the rest of the specs, the bandwidth of each band is all very similar. So I think it all comes down to software in the end and how well they can optimize the software on those. I know Linksys has been pretty aggressive, cranking out like updates every couple of weeks. Uh, the, uh, the TP-Link also uh, released a couple of updates since I got them. So it's, yeah, it's it's a pretty nice market. Uh, the companies behind those devices are pretty dedicated to those mesh networking things, and they put in the resources to make them better and faster. So you can see like regular optimization of their algorithm every week. And I wouldn't be uh, surprised if you got one when they were released. And like one year later, you, you can even get better performance. So that's it for this week. Uh, you can find the show notes at rgba.fm slash 56. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at underscore rgba.fm. You can find my friend Alex on Twitter at Valier. And you can find me on Twitter at Tyler Bernard. So have a nice week. Have a nice week. <laughs>